I'm happy to be among the teacher of teachers wherever, like in ICH as well as in Mehta Hospital. And whatever I am here today is because of my teachers. So this will have 140 slides, but don't get overawed. Whatever I'm going to show you, many of these you would have already experienced in your practice. And I'm just trying to share only my knowledge and sharing only about lungs because I cannot cover the whole of the X-ray, including bones, diseases of bone. I'm just going to give you a bird's eye view of other things, but mainly the lungs. And my humble greetings to all my teachers for helping me to come to this level. Not only my teachers, but also the patients from whom we have learned, we all have learned. We have extremes in X-rays. This is a picture from University of Washington Library, wherein you can see and read, stop two minutes to save your life, have a free X-ray without disrobing. So you have a big queue there, but now if you write even one X-ray, the parents, you can smell them. They have had that last cigar before they had entered your cabin, but they'll ask, will it cause cancer to my child? So from one extreme to the other extreme we have come, though still no one knows what is the exact safe radiation, but at least in a year, up to 14 X-rays, it is well below the permissible limit. The scope, I'll tell you the basics, then interpretation. X-ray interpretation, you need to interpret only black and white structures. But as in life, you have various shades of gray. You first have to know how a tissue appears on an X-ray Air and fat, they absorb relatively less X-rays, so they appear as black or, and dark gray respectively. Bones appear more X-radiation. And most of the soft tissue which are comprised mainly of water, they appear as shades of gray. So this is the grayscale image on X-ray. On the left extreme, it's the air. On the right extreme, it is the metal, which anyone will be able to make out. But bone is the next less, bone is the next uh, um, uh, less white or probably off white than metal. So in this picture, you'll be able to make out, I have shown air in two places. One outside the body, you have only air that also is black and what is inside the lung? That also is black. Now you come to the sides, you have the subcutaneous tissue, mainly fat. This is not black, but dark gray. Then you have the muscle, which has got more water, probably including blood. So this appears gray and bone appears white. Always you need to know about PA and AP film. In PA film, the beam passes from the posterior chest wall to the anterior chest wall. Close to the anterior chest wall is the cassette placed. And the direction of the beam is from posterior to anterior. The reverse happens with AP film. So where do you take the PA film, routine, OPD, older child, stable patients? Whereas AP film, most of the infants, probably even in the toddler age group, we take the AP films, that is a supine AP film, but much more than that, neonates, NICU, PICU, trauma, emergency room, head injury, theater, all these will have only AP film. The problem with AP film is the distance from the X-ray source to the cassette is less than six feet. That means the X-rays are not parallel when they impact the thorax. When they are not parallel when they impact the thorax, there is magnification. So your mediastinum 
appears magnified. The most important structure in the media sternum is the egg heart. In PA, because the rays are parallel, when they impact on the thorax, the media sternum is not magnified. But even with the AP film, you will be able to make out all the necessary uh, uh, like interpretations from the lungs. Don't think AP film, supine AP film is inferior. We'll be able to get all the details. Only thing, the media sternum will appear magnified that you keep it in the back of your mind. Before reading the x-ray, you need to have certain prerequisites. What are they? In this age of litigation, you need to make sure you are reading the correct patient's x-ray. So check the name, age, sex, and the date when the x-ray is taken. It should have a proper side marking, right or left. If these two are okay, then you look at penetration, rotation, inspiration, and movement artifact. What are they? We'll just, once again, brush up your knowledge. First is, side marking, R and L. Only one letter will be given. R means you place it rightly on the X-ray lobby properly. Phase of inspiration. We always talk about inspiratory film. A good inspiratory film means the dome of the diaphragm should correspond to the anterior end of the fifth to seventh rib. I feel like you'll be able to see the red color round. These are the anterior end of the ribs. You are able to count the fifth anterior end of the rib is seen above the diaphragm. That means it is an inspiratory film. If you're able to see up till the seventh anterior end of the rib, that's a very good inspiratory film. Why you need to know about inspiration? Because expiratory film can have crowding of the vessels at the lung basis and it can have exaggerated bronchovascular marking. You may mistake it for a subsegmental collapse or can be misinterpreted as a pneumonia. Then comes your rotation. When you look at the X-ray, the medial end of both the clavicle has to be equidistant from the midline. Midline means a vertical line through the center of the vertebral bodies. You see here, the red round ones are the medial end of the right and left clavicle. See how disparity, how much disparity is there between the two ends, medial ends of the clavicle. The right clavicle is much, much, much farther away from the midline. So when you're going to interpret, don't interpret this cardiac cell out as dextrocardia. And if there is a rotation to the right, you will have the manubrium sterni. You see the X-ray in the lower part, lower picture. The manubrium sterni sometimes can give a mimic of a lymph node because it is a rotated film. If you are able to identify this is a rotated film, you will not misinterpret it as a lymph node. This is just a manubrium sterni. And sometimes that can be over penetration or under penetration. What do you mean by correct penetration? Only when the intervertebral spaces, disc spaces can be seen through the heart shadow. Over penetration means you are able to see all the disc spaces very clearly. Under penetration means you are unable to see the intervertebral disc space. See, this is a normal penetration. You are just able to identify, able to see the intervertebral disc space. Now, you look at this film, you are able to see almost all right from the top between T1 and T2 to T9 to T10. But look at these two pictures. You are unable to see any intervertebral disc space. So under penetration, over penetration. So under over penetration, they will not give good details about the lung, whereas under penetration will exaggerate whatever the normal findings you have in X-ray chest in the lungs. Then movement artifact. 
Sometimes when amateurs take photograph, this is how it looks like. But sometimes when the child is crying too much, this can happen to any radiographer. We cannot find fault with the radiographer because you know how difficult it is to have an X-ray of a crying baby. Sometimes you can have shadows like this. So interpret, interpreting this movement artifacted X-ray is going to be difficult. So you might have to have a repeat X-ray if you think that you are unable to make out what is happening in the lungs. Now, I'm going to a slightly different uh, form of X-ray that is a lateral X-ray because most of the time we are comfortable with supine AP film. But lateral X-ray, most of the time we don't do it. Why? Because our teachers have told us we will be able to get all the uh, information from supine AP film. But sometimes we need to have lateral X-ray. When we have an equivocal frontal X-ray, frontal X-ray is nothing but your PA X-ray. It can, a lateral X-ray can rapidly exclude or confirm the most equivocal abnormalities seen on an X-ray chest PA view. It can tell whether the shadow is anterior or posterior. It can tell us which lobe. It can also check the hidden areas in the X-ray. The hidden areas in the X-ray are behind the heart, behind and in front of the hyla, and behind the domes of the diaphragm. And only if you are familiar with a normal X-ray, normal lateral film, you will be able to appreciate, you will be able to interpret the lateral X-ray. So this is how the lateral X-ray will be given. If it is a right lateral, the vertebral bodies will be to the right of the film. If it is a left lateral, your vertebral bodies will be close to the left border of the film. Okay? How do you decipher a lateral X-ray? We'll go step by step. Like lungs appear darker as you come from top to bottom. That means from superior to inferior, the lungs appear darker. Why? Because superior aspect, you have a lot of soft tissue including bones like scapula, which can hinder your film, which can hinder your passage of X-rays. So in a lateral X-ray, anteriorly or in one side, you'll be able to see the manubrium sterni and behind you'll be able to see the vertebral bodies. Next, you insert the heart into the lateral X-ray. Where will be the heart? It will be in the middle mediastinum. It will be close to the manubrium sterni. And from the heart, you have the arch of the iota going up and like coming down close to anterior to the thoracic vertebrae. In the lateral X-ray, you'll be able to see even the inferior vena cava as a straight border in the posterior inferior aspect of the heart. In addition to that, you add the pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery will be more anterior, uh, uh, like, uh, and the left pulmonary artery, it will arch over the left main bronchus, so it will be a little bit to the posterior aspect. Then you add the trachea and the bronchi. Okay, this is how you can make out what all the structures you are going to face in a lateral X-ray. So this is a right lateral film and you are able to see the manubrium sterni anteriorly. You are able to see the vertebral bodies on the other side. You are able to see the heart border. You are able to see the trachea. You are able to see the bronchial orifices too. Domes of the diaphragm both the domes of the diaphragm you'll be able to see. The right dome that is shown by the green triangle, apex of the green triangle, you're able to see the dome of the right dome from front to the back. You are able to see it through and through in your lateral X-ray. But that is not the same with the left dome of diaphragm. Why? Because 
you have the cardiac cell out, which is merging with the dome of the diaphragm. So you will not be able to differentiate separately. Only after the cardiac cell out is seen behind that only, you'll be able to see the left dome of diaphragm and you are able to trace it up till the back. Both the domes are crisp and clear. Arteries account for most of the hilar shadow. Okay? And the right main pulmonary artery, it will be in front of the right main bronchus, whereas your left main pulmonary artery will arch over the left main bronchus. Okay, you are able to locate the main pulmonary arteries, which is given in yellow. And what are these two arrows? These two arrows are nothing but your bronchi. Okay, this is the right bronchial orifice and the lower one is the left bronchial orifice, right? And the heart, you should be able to know about this right ventricle, which is green in color. You will not be able to see the right atrium, you will be able to see the right ventricle. Next, you see the left atrium, which is green in color, and you will be able to see the left ventricle. And inferior vena cava, I told you it will be in the posterior inferior aspect of the cardiac cell out, the lowermost aspect, you are able to see a straight line. In a uh, X-ray, a PA film, you'll be able to see sometimes on the right heart border, a straight line that is the small portion of the inferior vena cava, sometimes you'll be able to see it. These are all normal things. Why you need to know? Brush up the normal. If you are good in your basics, you can interpret your X-rays without much ado. Vertebral bodies. As you trace it from top to bottom, as you go through the lower thoracic vertebrae, because it is not interfered by any soft tissue shadow or scapula, you'll be able to appreciate it very clearly. But if it is not seen clearly, it indicates there is some pathology. You're able to see on this left side, you're able to see the lower thoracic vertebrae. Compare it with another X-ray, lateral X-ray. Are you able to see all the lateral, uh, all the lower thoracic? No, there is something hiding here. So something is not all right here. So you know there is some pathology in the lower lobe. When, when the th lower thoracic vertebral bodies are not seen clearly, then you know there is some pathology, okay? In a lateral X-ray, how the lobes will be seen? The right upper lobe will be in the upper half. The right middle lobe will be like a sector, okay? The right lower lobe will be in the posterior aspect, okay? So, in a lateral chest X-ray, you look at vertebral bodies, you look at the dome of the diaphragm, you look at the hyla, you look for change in density across the cardiac cell out and abnormal lung densities, but always, always, always kindly correlate with the X-ray chest PA view because you don't take the lateral chest X-ray as the first one. You take the chest X-ray PA or AP. If there is any problem, only then you go on to do the lateral chest X-ray. Now we'll come to the slightly easiest one, easier one, and you'll be familiar with the frontal X-ray, X-ray chest PA view. First, you need to look at the trachea and bronchi and the carina. The trachea passes to the right of the iota. So this is the trachea. You're able to see the trachea. This is the trachea. It passes slightly of midline to the right side and passes to the right of the aortic knuckle, right? Then, an adult physician always talk about hilar points, hilar points. These are useful points of reference. The hilar point is nothing but the angle formed when the upper and lower low pulmonary vessels meet. Sir, in this X-ray, where is the hilar point? 
Now I'll show you the hilar point. Are you able to make out? In an X-ray, sometimes you will not be able to uh, see it properly, but just uh, carefully look at the hyla. You'll be able to see this is the junction point, the angle form where upper and lower low pulmonary vessels meet. Always the left hilum is slightly higher than the right. Okay. If you are not able to make out, don't worry, because some patients, normal patients, you will not be able to decipher the hilar point. Then, can you see the pulmonary artery through the cardiac silhouette? How do you make out? This is how you make out. You know the right heart border is formed by the right atrium, but the right ventricle is close to it, the main pulmonary artery. It divides into right and left pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery goes in front of the right main bronchus, whereas the left pulmonary artery arches over the left main bronchus and goes posteriorly. Then looking at the lung fields, some say you can say as zone, some say you can uh, interpret as lobes, whichever way you are comfortable with, you can decipher. You can divide them into upper zone, mid zone, and lower zone. Try to compare and contrast the each side, right side with the left side upper zone, right side mid zone with the left side mid zone, and right side lower zone with the left side lower zone. But if you are comfortable with lobes, okay, you can interpret based on your upper lobe, right middle lobe, right lower lobe. Same way on the left side. So whichever way you are comfortable with, you can decipher. Whenever you see a white shadow in the lung field, only two things can be there. It can be a pneumonia. We call it consolidation. We can call it pneumonia. The only point and a collapse, a lung collapse, a low bar collapse, both appears as white shadows. How can you differentiate? If it is going to be a consolidation or a pneumonia, there is no loss of lung volume. If it is going to be a collapse, the volume loss is evident. Why is it white when there is a collapse? Because there is no air. Not only that, the mucus secretions back up and collect in the alveoli. So whenever any secretion is present within the airway, you are going to look at it like you are going to have a white appearance. That is why lobar collapse, you have the white color. Now we'll come to slightly more detailed about the lung parenchyma, alveolar and interstitium. See, the terminal bronchioles, these are the terminal bronchioles. It ends up in alveolar ducts. The alveolar ducts terminate in alveoli. The alveoli are the gas exchange units. The interstitium surrounds both the alveoli and the terminal bronchiole. It has got two functions, not only mechanical, but also dynamic function. Dynamic function, that means it allows fluid cells and nutrients pass into and out of the interstitium. See, many a times, like in conferences, in CMEs, they will say it is an alveolar disease, it is an air space disease. Both means the same. Don't split your head. Both alveolar disease and air space disease here, there is filling up of the alveolar air spaces with abnormal material. Normally, you should have only air. When there is no air, but you have abnormal material accumulation, either in the form of blood, pus, water, protein, cellular debris, or a combination of all these, then the alveoli is going to be opaque. It all depends on how much alveoli, how many numbers of how many hundreds of how many thousands of alveoli is involved. Based on the number, it can be fluffy, it can be ill-defined margin, or if there is going to be a large amount of alveoli 
having filled up with material, abnormal material, you can have a segmental or a lobar pneumonia. So if it is going to be a fluffy or ill-defined margin, the alveoli here in this region is not having air, but filled with abnormal material. Okay, you can call this as a pneumonia. This also as pneumonia, it all depends on how much percentage of the alveoli is filled up. If a large portion of one particular lobe is filled up with abnormal material in the alveoli, you have almost as appearance similar to that of a lobe. We call this pneumonia much more than that. We call it as a consolidation. You can use any term. If it is dense, we always have the habit of calling it as a consolidation. If it is less dense, we call this as pneumonia. I don't think we need to split our hair on these because these are all shadows. We need to interpret it properly based on the child's condition. I will come to interstitial disease. That means like which affects the supporting tissue of the lung parenchyma. It can be abnormal when there is edema, inflammation or fibrotic thickening. It can be linear, reticular, reticular with septal lines or reticular nodular. This is an X-ray of a four-year-old child who had had a bronchopulmonary dysplasia because the child was born as an 829 grammar and who was on ventilation for about around 40 days, but who was on home oxygen for about 10 months. Home oxygen, because child needed that one liter and then 0.5 liter to maintain a saturation above 94%. So this is the, like when the child came for admission for a respiratory problem, this was the x-ray and this is an interstitial pattern which can happen with many conditions including your BPD. It just tells you it is an interstitial shadow. It does not give you the diagnosis. You need to correlate with the child's condition to interpret it properly a combination of alveolar and interstitial. Many a times we just having have a look at the X-ray, we tell, hey, this looks like a viral pneumonia. How can we say that when you have both alveolar shadows and interstitial shadows, then you can term, because you had a clinician, you get the history, you see the child, and then you look at the X-ray, you are able to interpret it as a viral pneumonia. Many a times, we don't give this luxury to the radiologist because many a times we just write respiratory distress. We never give them a proper history so that they can interpret it properly. Now we'll come to low bar collapse. The volume loss will be evident. There will be elevation of the dome of the diaphragm. Number two, there can be decreased spacing between the ribs. There can be displacement of trachea, mediastinum, hilum. If it is a lateral X-ray, you will be able to make out the fissure. Even in a horror, uh, AP film, like uh, in a frontal X-ray, you will be able to see the displacement of the fissure too if it is a low bar collapse. We will just see how it is. Not only that, it affects the surrounding part. That means if the right upper lobe is collapsed, the middle and the lower lobe has to take over the function of the upper lobe. So they overinflate, they appear darker compared to the opposite side and the normal vessels, they are more spread out because the lung compensates for the loss of volume of the upper lobe, the right middle and lower lobe compensates. So your normal vessels appear more spread out when you compare it with the other side. If it is a right, Sorry for the mistake, this is not the upper lobe, this is the right lower lobe collapse. I'm extremely sorry, I apologize. This is an atelectasis collapse of the left lower lobe. This is how you will have the appearance in the lateral X-ray. If it is a collapse of the right middle lobe, 
right border of the heart will not be delineated separately. If it is a lateral film, you'll be able to see through the cardiac cell out an increased opacity, uh, something like an arc. There are certain mimickers for atelectasis, right upper lobe uh, collapse, it can be mimicked by a azagos fissure. Middle lobe collapse can be mimicked by a depressed sternum. The left lower lobe can be mimicked, atelectasis can be mimicked by a hiatus hernia. Collapse of the left upper lobe is very different. Why it is very different? There is a wheel-like density which covers much of the left hemithorax. See, you look at this film, there will be something like compared to the right side, left lung appears to be covered by a wheel-like density. How does it appear in real life? This is how it appears. Why I put the CT? Only then you will be able to appreciate whatever you are seeing here is an atelectasis. Okay, this is a wheel-like wheel density. Maybe I will call a dupatta over your left lung. This is how your left lung will appear. So this is a wheel-like density. The left heart border will be obscured either in part or in whole. And if you're able to see the left hilum, that will be much more elevated. Here, the penetration is not proper. Why? Because you are not able to look through the intervertebral disc space. That is why you are unable to see the left hilum. Otherwise, you will be able to see the left hilum, which would have been displaced much higher up too. Diaphragm, definitely you know, the uh, if the dome of the diaphragm you should be able to see the dome of the diaphragm very clearly. If the dome of the diaphragm is obliterated in part or whole, then you know there is a disease in the adjacent lower lobe. You should be able to see the costophrenic angle and the cardiophrenic angle. This is the cardiophrenic angle on either side. The costophrenic angle, the, like sometimes they'll call it as costophrenic recess. This is the deepest part and whenever you have any fluid accumulation, pleural fluid accumulation, this angle will get obliterated. When we come to pleural fluid, we'll just see that too. And the costophrenic recess, you can call this as angle or the recess. So when we come to pleural cavity, if there is going to be a minimal fluid, your costophrenic angle or your costophrenic recess will get filled up. And as more fluid accumulates, this is how you will have the appearance. Sometimes you will have a lamellar pleural effusion. That means a very small pleural fluid collection, which can happen with a pneumonia. We call it as a paranemonic effusion too. Sometimes you can have a pleural effusion in the minor fissure and insisted pleural effusion between the two layers of the pleura lining the horizontal fissure. So if you see all these, don't get overawed. Just know that there is pleural fluid. But what you need to know more is about the subpulmonic fluid. Subpulmonic fluid means effusion which is often difficult to distinguish from the dome of the diaphragm, but you can make it out how normally a normal dome of the diaphragm, the highest point will be somewhere in the middle of the dome of the diaphragm. If there is going to be a subpulmonic fluid, the highest point will be situated laterally. This is what the arrow shows. This is on the right side. On the left side, you have one more clue. Not only that, the highest point of the dome of the diaphragm is situated laterally, like here, but also the gap between this shadow and the stomach bubble will be too high. Normally, it will be closely applied between the left dome of diaphragm and the stomach bubble. But here, there is subpulmonic collection. That is why you have a big gap between the stomach bubble and the shadow on the left side. 
measuring the heart, everyone knows how to measure the cardiothoracic uh, ratio. More than 50%, you know, that is cardiomegaly. And you will be knowing about what forms the right heart border, the right atrium in the frontal X-ray, and your left atrial appendage, then your left ventricle in the like frontal X-ray. That means a AP or PA film. Iotic knuckle. See, this is how the iotic knuckle looks like. Your lateral border of the, the left border of the trachea is closely applied to the iotic knuckle. And displacement or loss of contour indicates there is a disease adjacent uh, to this part. That means there can be a lung consolidation. Sometimes in old age, there can be iotic aneurysm too. Iota pulmonary window or the pulmonary bay, that is the part just below the iotic knuckle. Now you will be able to see it clearly. This is the space where abnormal enlargement of the mediastinal lymph nodes will be seen and this space can get filled up. This can get filled up when you have a lot of blood flow through the pulmonary artery too, as in shunt lesion. But when you are looking at the lungs, if there is going to be a pathology, your mediastinal nodes are enlarged, this space will be occupied. And also know about paratracheal stripe. What is this paratracheal stripe? You know, this is the trachea. You just keep on following it. This is the right main bronchus. This is the paratracheal stripe. Now you are able to see it. It is created by the air lying on either side of the comparatively dense tracheal wall, right tracheal wall. Here you have air within the trachea. Here you have air within the lungs. This is the right tracheal wall and going on to become the right main bronchial wall. Okay, the left side you will not be able to see it very clearly because of the position of the aortic arch and great vessels. Now we'll come to lesions in the lung, periphery of the lung. You will not know whether it is coming from the pleura, whether it is coming in the periphery of the lung or whether it's coming from the rib. But you have certain clues to make out from where it arises from. The margins appear clear and well-defined if it is an intrapulmonary, not only that, the interface, now you are able to make out a small triangle appearing in the upper two. Okay, you are able to make out small triangles. So, if it is going to be an acute angle, then that means it is arising within the lung parenchyma. Only then you will have an acute angulation. Suppose if it is coming from the pleura or from the rib, this angle will be an obtuse angle. Are you able to see this brown line, this obtuse angle? So that means if you are able to make out the angle, not an acute but an obtuse angle, then you know this comes either from the pleura or from the ribs. Okay? Sill out. Sill out means normally it is an outline of a solid object. And silhouette out sign. Many a times in X-ray chest, we talk about silhouette out sign. It is a misnomer. What do you mean by misnomer? It actually refers to loss of part of the silhouette. Then we call it as a silhouette out sign. See, if you are you are able to see the rose clearly, that is a sill out. If you are not able to see the rose clearly, but only a part of it, part of it is obscured by something, then we call it as a sill out sign. Instead of the rose, think of this as a lung, wherein part of the lung is not visualized properly, then you know it is a sill out sign positive. Giving you examples, here you are able to See the right dome of diaphragm, left dome is not seen properly. This is a sellout sign. That means 
there is a pathology in the left lower lobe. Here, you are not able to see the left heart border properly. So there is a problem in the left upper lobe. Here, you are not able to see the right dome of diaphragm. That means there is a pathology in the right lower lobe. Here, you are not able to see the right heart border. There is a pathology in the middle lobe. So, this is what we call it as a positive cell out sign. It just refers to loss of part of the cell out. This is a deliberate misnomer. Okay. Sometimes in pneumonia, you can check out whether there is a cell out sign is present or not. Sometimes absent of a cell out sign tells where the shadow is not situated. Here you are able to see a shadow, but you are able to see the right heart border. That means it is not closely applied to the right heart border. It's behind the heart, posterior to the heart. So this is something happening behind the heart border on the right side. So it can be a cyst duplication cyst or something arising from the posterior mediastinum. Okay, but one thing for sure is this is not in the right middle lobe. This is what we can make out. So that also helps uh, absence of a cell out sign tells where the exact pathology is not there. And as a pediatrician, everyone has to know about normal thymus. Why? Because thymus comes in different shape, different size, different texture. So now we have come to halfway through. It is, I think, it is 70, I told you, 140 x-rays. So you have come to half the lecture. So be happy that the basics are over. Now we are coming to the real interpretation. Why I have told you basics for half an hour is just to refresh your knowledge because unless we read it, we may not be able to recollect everything. But if someone says, talks to you about the basics, very easy for you to recollect. So keep on reading the basics. You become very good interpreter of the X-ray findings. But before you go on to interpret the X-ray finding, you need to look at the thymus. Why? Because it comes in different shape. Different shape, like different, something like a sail sign. Here it is something like a bow. Here it is appearing like a node. Here it is appearing like a sail. Something like Ayrathil or an MGR. Ado anda paravai pola vendum. That song, no? That is how. Nowadays you don't see the sail. Okay? Except in Pirates of Caribbean. So you need to know how the thymus shape is looking like. Sometimes, how do you call this as a thymus, I thought it is a lymph node. I thought it's something like a cyst here. How can you differentiate? You can differentiate by doing simple investigation. That means an ultrasound. Because initially, I was thinking of this as thymus, but it was referred as a node. But by looking at the time, uh, by doing a ultrasound, we are able to make out that this is only a thymus because thymus is like our South Indian, Tamilian, always, wherever there is a place, we just try to go and occupy. We never fight for the seats. But what happens, like even if you tell the correct thing, some of the tech savvy parents, they will not believe you. They will not believe even if you document it as thymus, they will always have a Google doctor which tells what test you need to do. So they will spend money, which a multinational company is going to reimburse. This is an MRI, which shows the same thymus. Wherever there is a space, it goes and occupy. It does not impinge. It does not cause compression of the structures all around or wherever it is going and occupying. It does not compress any of the structures. Wherever there is a place, it just goes and occupies. That is how the thymus looks, thymus feels. So 
MRI shows this, then they were convinced, but I was thankful to them because they came once again and told me they had confirmed it by doing MRI. But for me, I thanked them, even though at heart initially I was very angry with them, but I cannot show it on the face. But I was happy because it gives me ample photograph for teaching purpose. So this is how a thymus look like in an MRI. So don't do a CT chest, don't do an MRI chest, request the radiologist to have an ultrasound chest, which will help us to find out whether the child, uh, the shadow, what you see in the X-ray is a thymus or not. The next mass spreader is Asaigas Fisher. How can you tell that this is an Asaigas Fisher? Unless you are aware about this, you will think of this as a node or a cyst. But Asaigas Fisher is one which you can see in an X-ray chest. This X-ray was taken for a respiratory infection and the radiologist reported this as a node. But I was very sure that it is only an Asaigas Fisher. What is Asaigas Fisher? Occasionally, the Asaigas vein, they reach the superior vena cava by passing through the substance of the right lobe. They trap a uh, segment of the right upper lobe and creates the Asegas fissure. Diagrammatically, this can be represented like this, but I will show you for teaching purpose an MRI uh, CT which tells you the Asegas vein, they go through the substance of the right upper lobe and reach the superior vena cava and creates the Asegas fissure and the Asegas lobe, it is not a separate lobe, it is part of the right upper lobe, okay? Only for teaching purpose, I have um, shown the CT, but whenever they say it is a node, like you need to at least document that what you are seeing is not a node, but it is only an Asegas fissure. So that time I need to do this CT. So by giving so much basics, you have fallen directly into my trap. So whenever you look at the X-ray, you will be a little bit tensed. Am I interpreting it as normal or am I not interpreting it as something abnormal? Like is my interpretation right or not right? But is there any easy way out? I always try to look for some easy ways. Yes, you have some easy ways too. What are they? I told you in the beginning of the lecture, if you are able to differentiate white and black, then you become a very good interpreter of X-ray. Just certain white structures, what are they? Subcutaneous tissue bones and heart. What are the black structures? Mainly the lung. Lungs means what do you look at? Number, volume, aeration, parenchyma, lung, parenchyma, that's all. So you look at three white structures, three black structures, that's it. Your interpretation is going to be perfect. Okay, this is the easiest way. So now we'll come to the white structures first. Always I have a like inclination to look at anyone who is fair because I'm dark, always get fascinated by a fair color, whether it is same sex or opposite sex. If someone is fair, you just keep on looking at them, but nothing is there in color. But in X-rays, you need to interpret white and black properly. Here, you first look at the white structures. I told you subcutaneous tissue, Look at it on both sides of this X-ray. You are able to have a very thick subcutaneous tissue. This is because of fluid in the subcutaneous tissue. Where all fluid can accumulate? In which condition fluid can accumulate in nephrotic syndrome or third spacing as in dengue? Why in dengue? Because this child also has got a right pleural fluid. Although there is a pleural line on the left side too, but you are able to see it 
like more fluid on the right side, this type of pleural fluid in a dengue season, third spacing, like why you take an X-ray to document third spacing? No, when the child has respiratory distress, we take an X-ray. So this is an add-on finding. So it just tells you there is third spacing. Sometimes in the subcutaneous tissue, when you keep on looking, something which is almost white with the shadow of, with the similarity of a bone density appears here. And you have a globular swelling. What is it? It's a left axillary node with the calcification. So it tells you there is calcification in the left axillary node. Like it can be either a BCG adenitis which has healed or something else like a, a TB which has got a, a node which has got calcified, which has healed and calcified. And what is this X-ray? It shows an asymmetry in the subcutaneous tissue on the sides of the chest wall. Always when there is an asymmetry, the red flag, it is a red flag sign. Why it is a red flag sign? It always indicates danger. It indicates that there is cellulitis in that particular site. Unilateral cellulitis, usually it is due to a necrotizing fasciitis. This X-ray, I took it from Tangavelu Sir. Thanks to him, you are able to see this X-ray. And thanks to him, I have this photograph too, because this is not a medical condition. This is a surgical condition wherein you remove the necrosed fascia and load them with proper antibiotics so that you are able to save the life of the child. Okay, this is a place, this x-ray tells you that an unilateral increase in the soft tissue density, it is an ominous sign, immediately you need to act immediately and get the help of the pediatric surgeon so that they can help you in the management. It's a team management. Now the next white structure. We look at the bones. The bones, this is the normal density. But here, what do you see? The bones appear much more denser. So what is the diagnosis? It is a dense bone disease. Very easy. Only two dense bone disease can be there. Osteopetrosis and pycnodisastrosis. What will happen if the bones does not appear dense, but appear rarefied? In this picture, you are unable to see the ribs properly. Even though the X-ray penetration is proper, you are able to see the intervertebral disc space. You are not able to see the X-ray. You are not able to see the bone density properly. Why? The bones appear rarefied. Why is it rarefied? There is some problem with the mineralization. And you are able to see much more clearly there is a widening of the growth plate. You can call it cupping, fraying, but there is a widening of the growth plate. There is a big gap. Not only that, are you able to see the widening of the anterior ends of the rib, a bulbous anterior end of the rib. You can make out, you can make a diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency by looking at a chest X-ray. You like, all the chest X-rays will have the upper end of humerus. Here it is not seen properly, but here you are able to see the widening of the growth plate. Just one X-ray, you are able to come to a diagnosis. Sometimes with the children being wrapped up in three layers of dress, especially nowadays very difficult to examine boys. Why? Because they dress like Vijay. Like they have a bunion, over that they have a t-shirt, over that they have a shirt or a jacket. To undress them, it takes a long time and we try to not fully undress them because it takes a long time. Very easy for girls because many a times mothers, like they always make their girl children wear only very light cloths, thin cloths, or a single clothing only. So very easy for you to make out any problem in the bones, rachitic rosary, but difficult in 
a male child. And sometimes you'll be able to see the anterior end of the ribs alone more prominently. Not only that, you'll be able to see the inferior angle of scapula and the medial border of scapula as if you had chalked it out. It happens when heavy metals get deposited. The common heavy metal poisoning, what we see in our practice or what we were seeing in our practice maybe about 10 years back was lead poisoning. Now, the incidence, I won't say it is high, but it is less compared to our PG time. Sometimes you see bones like this when the child has got kyphoscoliosis and some of the uh, spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne's muscular atrophy, when they become bedridden or wheelchair ridden, this is the posture which they attain because of the muscle weakness. Here, very difficult for you to differentiate or decipher clearly whether it is a pneumonia or not. So here, that is why I say always try to interpret the X-ray with the clinical history. Don't try to interpret it alone just by uh, the X-ray appearance alone. You need to get the history, examination, and then correlate your findings with the X-ray finding. Now we come to diaphragm. Normally, we, I told you, both in AP and lateral, you'll be able to see the dome of the diaphragm crisp, clear. What happens here? The right dome is seen properly, but the left dome, it's seen higher up in the thoracic cavity and you are able to see the hostations. What happens here? There is an even tracing of the left dome of diaphragm. And here you are able to see the like mediastinal shift also. You think as if there is a dextrocardia. It's not a dextrocardia, but because of the even tracing, there is a big mediastinal shift. That is why your heart appears on the right side. Okay. So, and uh, always, whenever you have any doubt what is happening inside, sometimes uh, when you are going to make out the diagnosis with your auscultation itself, then when you're going to have an X-ray, ideal to have an NG tube placement because this will tell you where the stomach is. In this X-ray, there is even tracing of the right dome of diaphragm. Why I had given this CT picture? Sometimes we need to confirm before surgery too, because they will come with respiratory distress. You are able to see the NG tube also. The tube is the uh, uh, end of the tube is in the stomach, but the right side, half the thorax is filled with the liver. You can see it in the CT film too. Sometimes you'll be able to, uh, uh, sometimes you get a referral this as a persistent pneumonia, sometimes as a duplication cyst, but a closer look, it does not have the appearance of any particular lobe, middle lobe or lower lobe. It does not have the appearance of a cyst because it will be at least as a circular one, but here there is a segmental eventration of the dome of the diaphragm. There is a condition called a segmental eventration. That means not the whole diaphragm, a part of the diaphragm has eventration. It is weak. So how do you make this out? Here it is the right heart border is not seen properly you are not able to see the right heart border clearly. So this is an anterior segmental eventration. You want to confirm? Yes, you can confirm. Here you are able to see the anterior segmental eventration. Do you need a lateral X-ray for this? No. If you are good in your basics, yes, you can make it out because the right heart border is not seen properly. This segmental eventration is an anterior segmental eventration. Okay, now we'll come to dark structure, black structure. Lungs, look at the number, aeration, parenchymal shadows, airways. Then what is closely applied to the lung? The pleural cavity. 
Then what is close relation uh, in close relation with the lungs? Mediastinum. So look at the number first. When you're going to have a single lung visualized, you won't know whether it is an atelectasis or whether it's a single lung. So here, if you are going to go by the history, a child who has got, who is growing well, who has got a mild tachypnea or like you may not even appreciate that unless you do the respiratory rate counting for one full minute, they have come for some respiratory ailment. You take an X-ray, you see the ribs inter, uh, uh, intercostal spaces. It is very narrow. Child otherwise remains asymptomatic except for a slightly faster breathing. And the child is an older child. This most likely is an agenesis of the lung. But when a lung which is normally functioning suddenly collapses, you are going to have symptoms because lung takes a long time to compensate for a, a reduction in the lung volume. This is an acute atelectasis post a PDA, clipping the left lung went in for an atelectasis. This is a child who had a mucus plug and had an atelectasis of the left lung. In both these conditions, like uh, the child had acute respiratory illness. That means acute uh, respiratory distress child was on oxygen in ICU. But in an agenesis, child will not be acutely ill. You can make out the diagnosis by doing either an echo because scopy is not available most of the time. Echo can tell you a suggestive that it can be an agenesis because you can look at the size of the pulmonary vessel, whether the pulmonary vessel is present or not. And next, like you will always do a CT chest because you will try to rule out something. But if you don't have to do a CT chest, you can do a flexible scopy, find out whether the child has got a carina, no carina, the trachea continuing as the left main bronchus. The clues here are the intervertebral, the intercostal spaces are very narrow, unlike in atelectasis, and the child will not be in respiratory distress. We look at the aeration. Like if both the lungs have got more air, this is how the lungs look like. It is something like a box-like lung on either side, rectangular in shape. You are able to see the eighth rib anteriorly. You are able to see the eighth rib anteriorly. So a very good inspirator film, you can say. But if there is a hyperinflation, only then the apex part, the upper part of the lung fields will appear this much grossly enlarged. This appears like a rectangular box. This happens in untreated or partly treated or poorly controlled asthma. And you are able to see the flattening of the diaphragm too. Now, coming to increased air, but only in one lung. See, compared to the right side, the left lung has got more air. Why do you say more air? It appears darker. Still, you have the bronchovascular marking, so the air is within the lung. And also, the dome of the diaphragm also is lower down, flattened out. So, there is left lung hyperinflation. This can happen with anything intraluminally or any compression extraluminally. Common things common, foreign body we always think about, but always they will say, whenever there is an obstructive hyperinflation, they'll say, sir, is this a congenital lobe or emphysema? If it is a congenital lobe or emphysema, you will always have collapse of the underlying or the overlying lobe. I'll come to it a little bit later. But whenever you have increased air, in one lung, an obstructive hyperinflation, you have to look for an endo, uh, like intraluminal pathology, common things in children, foreign body. 
Number two, sir, I am unable to make out whether there is more air here, but there was a uh, faint history. There was a uh, mother says after three days prayer or four days prayer, child had something aspirated, but child otherwise is doing fine. Is it a hyperinflation? I'm not able to make out. In these children, you can do a expiratory film. If it is going to be a forced expiration, that means by applying pressure over the abdomen, you'll be able to appreciate much more. But a good expiratory film, you'll be able to see air trapping in one lung. This indicates that there is a possibility of a foreign body in the right main bronchus. So by doing an inspiratory expiratory film, sometimes equivocal foreign body in one of the bronchi, you will be able to make out by an inspiratory and expiratory film. Now we come to the closest differential because everyone will ask for congenital lobar emphysema. How can I differentiate it from a congenital lobar emphysema? Definitely here, there is a mediastinal shift. The left lung appears having, uh, left lung has more air compared to the right side. Is it in the whole lung or part of the lung? See lower down, you are able to see this is a collapsed left lower lobe. So you have a herniation of the left upper lobe crossing the midline going towards the right side. That is a mediastinal shift. That is atelectasis of the left lower lobe. This is a congenital lobar emphysema. Now come, come here. Is there any difference? Yes, there is some abnormality in the right side because there is some abnormality in the right side, but it is in the mid zone. But a closer look, how will you be able to make out this only if you're going to look at it in a lobby? You know the child has got a problem. That is why you ask for an X-ray. In this, you in this you have more air in the mid zone, there is a collapse of the left, the right lower lobe, there is collapse of the right upper lobe too. Here, there is a right middle lobe emphysema, congenital lobar emphysema. So this is how you can differentiate. Okay, you are able to differentiate this, you are able to make out the collapsed right, left lower lobe, the right lower lobe, right upper lobe you'll be able to make it out only if you visualize it in an X-ray lobby, okay? One more finding. Here, you are able to see the bulbous end of the anterior ends of the ribs. What does it indicate? The style also has got a vitamin D deficiency in addition. You don't have a rickety grocery or a widening of the growth plate, but you are able to see the bulbous end. This indicates this child also has got a vitamin D deficiency too. So just because the child has got one finding, don't miss out the other finding too. Lung air trapping. This is a localized air trapping, but here you are able to see some lines here, some line here, some line here. There is a localized air trapping. This type of picture can come with lung cyst or in other words, you can call this as CCAM previously. Nowadays, it is called as CPAM, congenital pulmonary airway malformation. We will be familiar with congenital cystadenomatoid malformation, but this gives the clue that this is a CPAM. How do you make out the diagnosis? By doing a CT chest, but X-ray gives the clue. We were talking about increased air. Now we'll talk about decreased air. Decreased air can come with hypoplasia of the lung, developmental anomaly, wherein one of the lungs is not developed like the other lung. Here there is hypoplasia of the right lung. Here there is hypoplasia of the left lung. Why do you say hypoplasia? So just by looking at it. The volume loss is there. Sir, this is a rotated film. Can you make it out? Yes. Like rotated film with the rotated film, you need to make it out properly. If it is a rotated film, the heart will be more to the right side. 
but here it is to the left side. So taking into account the rotation too, I know the left lung volume is less. So there is small, the development of the lung, left lung is not appropriate. We can call it hypoplasia. How do you make it out? Yes, you can do an echo. You can find out the pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, smaller caliber. When you do a bronchoscopy, you will be able to see very narrow bronchi, left main bronchi, and pruning appearing very early in the subdivisions. Here, the right lung hypoplasia. Why? Because you are able to still able to see the lung markings, but the volume is less. And whenever you have a right lung hypoplasia, always think, are you missing out a scimitar syndrome? Scimitar, it's something like your, how can you make out a right lung hypoplasia means, look for a scimitar vein. Here, this is a angio wherein you are able to make out the pulmonary artery, the lungs getting the supply from the abdominal iota and draining into the inferior vena cava. So you can have a scimitar syndrome. So whenever you have a right lung hypoplasia, always find out whether there is associated scimitar syndrome. Now we'll look at localized absence of air. Whenever there is a localized absence of air, we call it as atelectasis. So here, what do you see? Here, there is atelectasis of right lower lobe, right lower lobe here, right middle and lower lobe. Why do you say there is atelectasis of right middle and lower lobe? You're not able to see the medial border, right heart border. Right heart border is closely applied with the right middle lobe. So there is middle lobe atelectasis and lower lobe atelectasis. Here you are able to see the right heart border, but you are not able to see the right dome of the diaphragm properly. So this is a right lower lobe. This is both lower lobes. This is right lower lobe atelectasis in a child who had had a post cardiac surgery child. Right lower lobe atelectasis, right upper lobe atelectasis common in uh, infancy when they have aspiration pneumonia straight line, a retrocardiac atelectasis. So you should be able to make it out in the X-ray chest. Now we'll come to parenchymal shadows. One look at it, you know, this is a national disease of India. What is it? It is nothing but tuberculosis. Can you make it out any specific appearance? You can have fibrosis, you can have fluffy infiltrates, you can have cavities. So this is how an active tuberculous disease will present like in the lung parenchyma. Is there any other finding? Yes, sometimes you can have pleural fluid, okay? You can have infiltrate, right middle lobe, right middle lobe infiltrate. Why? Because the drainage has got a necklace of lymph nodes around the right middle lobe orifice so that when there is an enlargement, you have problems in the right middle lobe. Many a times it happens with tuberculosis, okay? And what are these findings? You have the mediastinal adenitis here. You are able to make out this hilum, the left hilar point that is filled in by the left mediastinal or the hilar node. Here, you are able to see multiple multiple symmetrical opacities, rounded opacities. This is how a miliary modeling will look like. Here, you are able to see a big cavity, a pneumonia and node. And this is a node with a pneumonia. So all these are part and parcel of tuberculosis, depending on the stage when they come to the healthcare facility. Sometimes you will be uh, seeing uh, ICU patients wherein you will have pictures like this. Here, you are not able to see the right dome of the diaphragm also clearly. 
you are able to see the air bronchogram. You are able to make out there are some cavities here, but a consolidation here again because you are able to see the air bronchogram. The same child after, during the course of treatment, you see necrosis, cavities, multiple cavities, the consolidation leading on to cavities. This is nothing but your necrotizing pneumonia. This is not very common, but you do see it, necrotizing pneumonia. Then you are very familiar with viral pneumonia. What is viral pneumonia? Parahylar peribronchial infiltrates. This is how your viral pneumonia looks like. In COVID season, you have separate, you have very distinct entity, reverse halo, peripheral ground glassing, but that is all CT. In X-ray, we may not be able to see that, but common viral respiratory pneumonia, the, uh, like pneumonia due to respiratory viral pathogens. This is how the X-ray looks like. Parenchymal shadows. Sometimes you'll be able to see air fluid level. What is this air fluid level? This is, you are not able to see any lung bronchovascular markings here. So it is a cavity with an air fluid level. This is a lung abscess. Same way, you are able to see the lower down convex margin and no uh, bronchovascular marking. You have a horizontal line. This is a lung abscess right upper lobe. There is a patch of pneumonia in the left upper lobe too. And in this X-ray, what you are able to see? You are able to see the main trachea, right main bronchus, left main bronchus, but through and through what you are able to see through the dome of the diaphragm, you are able to see some shadow here with air. It's a like, it is a lung abscess. Why do you say it is a lung abscess? You give treatment, they will disappear like this, but how do you say this is a lung abscess? You take a CT, you will be able to make out that the child has got a lung abscess. But for the sake of diagnosing a lung abscess, I don't think you need to have a CT chest. You can treat them with good antibiotics over a period of time, they do settle down. So if you're going to take a X-ray chest, this is how it looks like. If you take the CT, this is how the lung abscess looks like. Okay, abscess within the lung parenchyma, that is why the acute angle. Previously, I was talking to you about the acute angulation. If it is within the lung parenchyma, you will have the acute angulation. Are you able to make out this acute angulation? Fine. Sometimes, like rare conditions, not so common in immunodeficiency, you are not going to see immunodeficiency day in and day out but sometimes it can develop in front of our eyes. We'll be thinking this of as only a small patch of pneumonia. Sometimes we can call it as a round pneumonia too, but when it does not get resolved, but keeps on growing, then you know something is not all right. Then you do all the investigations, found, find this out to be a chronic granulomatous disease. And you know that one of the signature organisms in chronic granulomatous disease can be aspergillus. How do you make out an aspergilloma? Like not by looking at the X-ray, but you can suspect when you're going to have a development of a round shadow over a period of time, in spite of your treatment, either your antibiotics are not working or you are giving a wrong antimicrobial to a particular pathogen. If it is going to be a fungus, it is not going to respond to your antibiotics. So you need to investigate further and make out what is causing this particular shadow, whether it is a virus, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a fungus, is there any underlying condition which is making the child prone to develop this sort of infection? Now coming to bronchic cases. Bronchic cases has got some of the X-ray abnormalities. It can be subtle or it can be gross. Okay, you can have something like a tram line. What do you mean by a tram line? Like you see number one and number four. These are thickened bronchial walls. 
Then number two, this is cylindrical bronchiectasis. They will say they will say reversible bronchiectasis. That means the bronchi normally does not undergo the normal tapering uh, tendency. They don't have the normal pruning character. They remain, they have the same caliber throat that is a tubular shadow. Sometimes you can have cysts or ring shadows. This is extreme bronchodilation. You are able to see in this x-ray, there is an atelectasis. You are able to see the sill out through the cardiac shadow. This is an atelectasis, but low down, what do you see? Multiple cavities or whitening or enlarged bronchus. There is no tapering of the bronchus. This is a atelectatic bronchiectasis. Now, what do you see in this? A hyperinflation, yes, very good. And you are able to see the dilated or thickened bronchial wall. You are able to see this parallel line, tram line. You are able to see this. Then you are able to see small cystic cavities, dilated bronchi. So this is a mucus plug, which is obstructing the dilated bronchus too. So all these appearance are suggestive of a bronchiectasis. But sometimes when you have uh, a shadow, a mediastinal widening like this, we always tell you kindly look at the airway, trachea and the main bronchi. Are you able to make out where the trachea is in this child? No, you are not able to make out. Why? Because it is compressed by nodes. Sir, I'm not able to see where the trachea is. So I'll draw the outline. Are you able to make out the tracheal outline? The tracheal outline, you are able to see it above, but here it is very narrow. Why? Because it is compressed by the nodes, media sternal nodes. Then you are able to see lower down the right lower low bronchus, the left main bronchus are able to see, not able to see. Why? Because this again is narrowed. Are you able to make out? So, you need to look at the airway so that you can make out a diagnosis of nodes compressing on both sides till the child is alive. This can happen with tuberculosis most often. If it is going to be a tumor, most of the time, like they succumb if you don't treat. But tuberculosis, even with this big uh, nodes, they can go on for weeks together, months together. Now we'll come to pleural fluid. Pleural fluid has got many avatars. This is one sort of pleural fluid. You are able to see the right heart, uh, the right lung appearing under a wheel of white color cloth. This is because of the pleural fluid. You are able to see even the pleural fluid line compared to the left side, your right side is appearing a little bit opaque. This is because of the pleural fluid in the season, during winter season. If the child had had fever, we'll straight away tell this is a dengue fever. Same way here, not only there is pleural fluid, I told you subpulmonic fluid. Subpulmonic, why? Because the highest point of the dome of the diaphragm is in the lateral aspect, not in the middle. Okay? Now, same way I told you, subpulmonic fluid on the left side, the dome of the diaphragm, and you are able to see the stomach bubble here. So this much is the subpulmonic fluid on the left side. You have obliteration of the angle on the left side. You have pleural fluid. So you can have pleural fluid, many avatars, Sometimes you can have fluid in the minor fissure. This is how your paranemonic effusion, your minor fissure, it is extending into the minor fissure. So this is how a paranemonic effusion or a pleural fluid can happen. If it is going to be a slowly uh, occurring pleural fluid, slowly collecting pleural fluid, you have a concave margin. You can call this as an Ellis curve. This happens most of the time with tuberculosis when there is slow accumulation of pleural effusion. 
Okay, I told you about the subpulmonic fluid. I told you where the highest point of the dome of the diaphragm will be normally, but in the subpulmonic fluid collection, this will be in the lateral part, not in the middle of the diaphragm. Okay. Excuse then we'll me, sir. Yes, uh, sir. It's nine five. We have ten more minutes, sir. Till I nine fifteen, we can have. Yes, madam. I have Thank another you, eighteen slides. We'll finish. Okay, it. sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Pyothorax and pyopneumothorax, sick child, uniform density, shift of the mediastinum. You are going to have widened intercostal spaces. So it is a pyothorax. Okay, empyema, or we can call pyothorax. But sometimes uh, you will have pus plus air, pyopneumothorax. If you don't treat a pyopneumothorax, if you don't intervene, it can keep on increasing. And if you take a supine film, this is how it will look like. If you take as a, uh, if you take a AP film, this is how it will look like. If you take a supine bed, bed X-ray, this is how the same pyopneumothorax will look like. But once you insert an ICD. Yes, everything can get relieved. So a good teaching X-ray, you can have a lot of pneumatoceles. Whenever you have pneumatoceles, most likely we think of staph as, uh, as the etiology. Pension pneumothorax means always the dome of the diaphragm will be depressed and flattened. It is almost always an emergency. If it is a bilateral, it is fatal. Here it's a bilateral pneumothorax. Sometimes you can have spontaneous pneumothorax wherein your dome of the diaphragm, it is not a tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax, it's flattened. It is depressed. <laughs> but here there is no tension pneumothorax. The dome is not depressed. It is not flattened. This can happen sometimes in adolescence. And if you have air leak, this is how the air leak looks like a pneumomediastinum. That can be lifting up of the thymus and you can have subcutaneous tissue. Previously, we used to incise all the subcutaneous. In the subcutaneous plane, we'll do multiple incision, but it is not needed. No, previously we were on, uh, like we used to try to like relieve the subcutaneous emphysema, but nowadays we know that it is not needed. And mediastinum, here you are able to look at the mediastinal widening due to nodes, lymph nodes, but not only that, you can have mass in the mediastinum, which can seal out the cardiac shadow. This is the right left upper border, which is sealed out by the uh, mediastinal mass. Here, this is not this is behind the heart because you are able to see the left heart border and you are going to you are having an obstructive hyperinflation to flatten diaphragm more air so there is air trapping there is compression of the left uh, uh, left main bronchus too so you can make out so many things with a simple x ray and if you are working in icu you need to look at the nodes, uh, you need to look at the lines, the ET tube, the NG tube, the central lines. Sometimes you can have lines coming out like this. What are they? They are nothing but VP shunt, which can come from the neck up to the peritoneum. Many a times you will be seeing going up till the pelvic cavity too, because when the child grows, the tube will not grow but you cannot keep on repeating the, uh, like removing and reinserting the VP shunt. So they always insert a longer length VP shunt tube. Mishaps like this should not happen. You should not insert a tube into a localized pocket of aeration. You are still able to see the bronchovascular markings, but if you don't look at the X-ray in the lobby, you can have mishaps. Just because I give you advice, it does not mean that I'm smarter than you. It just means I have done more stupid stuff than you. 
including inserting an ICD in a child who had had a extreme eventration of the dome of the diaphragm in the midnight in ICH during my PG time. But I have made, I have realized my mistake. Then I know that my duty is to always look at the X-ray in the X-ray lobby. The carry home points, chest X-ray deals with shades of gray from white to black. Always read the X-ray in the X-ray lobby, but not by looking through the tube light in the ceiling. Reading chest X-ray is an art. It cannot be taught. So this is the end, but there is no end to learning. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Sir, for this uh, very, uh, very clear, I think you've just gone from skin to almost all the structures deep in uh, stressing on the thing. There was initially one question in the Q&A, but even that is not there. I think uh, you were so clear that people don't have questions. <laughs> the, question, the question is there. The question is there. There's I mean, one there, question in the... Yeah. But the question is, how is a subcutaneous tissue widening related to third spacing or uh, pleural effusion, which are at different uh, plants? Pleural effusion is different. Don't confuse pleural effusion with uh, widening of the subcutaneous tissue. You know, when you are going to take an X-ray, you are a clinician, you know what the condition of the child is. You are not going to find or diagnose third spacing by looking at the, by taking an X-ray. It is clinically, you will be able to make out. When you have an X-ray, if you are looking at for the first time in a child who has got a fever, thrombocytopenia during a winter time, you can just jolly well say that there is third spacing. You don't take a chest X-ray to document or to diagnose third spacing. When there is going to be a pleural effusion, if there is going to be a thin fluid in a child who has got a fever in a season time, you always, even before you ask for investigation, if the child comes with distress, you take an X-ray, you don't know what the child has got on day three, day four, day five. If you have a pleural fluid, a thin film of pleural fluid, you always suspect a viral hemorrhagic fever, but you don't make you don't make a diagnosis. You don't take an X-ray to make a diagnosis of third spacing. The same appearance can happen with obese children too. Okay, but clinicians we know what for we are taking X-ray, so we'll be able to interpret it properly. So one other question how to differentiate between obstructive emphysema and pneumothorax with an X-ray? See, obstructive emphysema, you will be able to see the bronchovascular markings. In a pneumothorax, the lung is collapsed. Whatever you see on one hemithorax, it is only jet black. Always, as Dr. Tangavelu sir says, the clue is, you always have the air by the side of the X-ray, like beyond the X-ray film, like uh, beyond the body of the child, you have air in the atmosphere, which is also ca captured in the X-ray, chest X-ray. Compare it. Compare it in the sense you will see the same type of jet black intensity if it is going to be a pneumothorax. If it is going to be an obstructive emphysema, obstructive hyperinflation, even though it is darker, you'll be able to see the bronchovascular marking. That is why I say, kindly look at the X-ray in the X-ray lobby. In both obstructive emphysema, as well as in pneumothorax, you will not be able to hear the bronch uh, like uh, breath sound. But you look at it in a lobby, you will not make mistakes. Viral pneumonia and lipoid pneumonia have a similar picture because both are supposed to have a paracardiac shadow. Somebody's asked this question. Like you take an X-ray to find out how much 
the lung is involved, how much, uh, like whenever you are seeing them for the first time. If the child had had bad child rearing practice, then whatever picture you get, you always think of it as a lipoid pneumonia. By, just by looking at the chest X-ray, you will not be able to say whether it's a viral or whether it's a lipoid, even though lipoid, usually they have, previously I used to call this as a butterfly pattern. It will always be in the medial third of the lungs all around the heart, something like a butterfly with its wing open. This is how a lipoid pneumonia looks like, but all these are subjective. But you are a clinician. You get the history, then you look at the X-ray. But with only an X-ray, very difficult to make out it is a lipoid or it's a viral, unless otherwise the lipoid pneumonia is extensive. How will you differentiate between kyphosis and scoliosis? It's clinical. We don't look at uh, we don't look diagnosis by X-ray, but it's a clinical diagnosis. Whenever you have a child with SMA or Duchenne's or a child who is on wheelchair and has got respiratory issues, you take an X-ray, you need to interpret it based on your clinical findings. You're able to hear crackles. Like even if you're not able to hear a bronchial breathing, the child's respiratory rate and you are having crackles on one side and you try to interpret this finding with the X-ray finding. That is how you interpret when there is a kyphoscoliosis. There are no more questions in the chat box. Uh, such a fantastic uh, um, explanation that is, you've taken us through so much, almost we felt like uh, being in the Institute of Child Health, listening to the professor of radiology. So it was so good and such clarity of pictures and thank you uh, for uh, enlightening. And it was really an academic uh, feast. Sir. All of us have enjoyed your uh, lecture and uh, I hand over the so further proceedings to the TNSC team, Dr. Chendil and Dr. Rajendra and Dr. Smai. Happy. Can I add Dr. Chendil? Can I add one more? I just want to thank Dr. Nandini Kumaran for having put up with me because she had message, she had WhatsApp. I failed to reply to her. And after that, like late, I realized that I had missed everything. Apology to you, madam, for the late yes, reply. <laughs> and number two, my sincere thanks to all the delegates. I told you it is almost 140 slides. You had sat through the whole 140 slides. My thanks to all of you for bearing with me. Thanks for the opportunity, IAPTNSE. This is what I can say to my seniors. Thanks a lot. We are really happy to see you uh, join the light band of master teachers and uh, with uh, such a crisp and clear presentation with just black and white. And you have been so wonderful and so, I mean, uh, we, I mean, as uh, said, we were back to the ICH days and uh, we were, uh, as if we were literally and virtually, we were in ICH. So thank you for. Uh, that extensive and excellent presentation. We are really very happy for you. And uh, to see our friend Gauri to be uh, in such a elite band, I'm really happy for you. Thank you so much. And uh, over to Dr. Ismail. Thank you, Gauri. And I'm very much elated. Usually, we used to listen to uh, Professor Elizabeth John at the post operator, I mean, post admission days, and to make our diagnosis, she used to be soft and supple. And you are an augmented version of Elizabeth John now. Very beautiful. I never imagined to listen to you in such a uh, dignified manner. And as Sendhil rightly pointed out, you have joined the elite band of the teachers. And we are really proud of you, Gauri. Such a beautiful, you made the black and white so colorful today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before going to out of science, uh, two more questions now. Yeah. Uh, in your personal experience, 
do you find any correlation between the x-ray patterns and the etiological agent in a community acquired pneumonia definitely not i will think staff it will come as strep pneumonia so many a times i have failed so i can interpret shadows but i cannot find out the etiology Uh, another question is uh, how to differentiate between lower lobe adelectasis and evaporation of diaphragm of right side. Always adelectasis is a straight line. If it is going to be an evaporation, it is going to have the outline of the dome of the diaphragm. Anyone can make out how a straight line looks and how a curved line looks. So that is it. And another one is what is the difference between collapse and hyperplasia? Why no crowding of the cerebs? Collapse means there is no air in the lung, so it appears opaque, white. Whereas in hypoplasia, it is a miniature version of the normal lung, so you have air in it. So in atelectasis, you are going to have, if it is a long-standing one, you are going to have. a crowding of the ribs in hypoplasia yes your intercostal space is going to be a little bit narrow but much more than that there will be a shift of the mediastinum and it is a diagnosis which we make out by doing other investigations too common what you have just have an echo done it will just show you the size of the pulmonary vessel with which you can make out whether the side the lung itself is small by looking at the anatomy of the pulmonary artery size of the pulmonary artery that helps you need not go in for a ct need not do a bronchoscopy it just there is a miniature lung so just keep it in the back of mind and it is not going to cause any problem but in the right side always think whether the child has got anything like a scimitar that is a only thing which you need to have it in mind okay finally my vote up thanks Uh, just a minute, Rajendra. Yeah. One basic doubt to Gauri. Uh, in children, I mean, in adults, you take the X-ray as uh, you ask them to have an inspiration. In children, you cannot do that. But how come uh, the uh, technique is uh, right by the radiographer? Uh, they take it as a good X-ray in an expiratory film. And is there any technique, or uh, how long, how, how many times you are asked to repeat the X-ray for an expiratory film? um thing is radiographer are a different gen genre and uh, the most inexperienced are the one who just pass out and join the hospital because most of the hospitals pay them very less a good radiographer like very difficult to find out but uh they know when the child cries they uh, when the child lies down on the uh, x-ray tab table immediately they don't take the x-ray they keep on looking at the child with experience they are able to make out when the child cries to the maximum that time they uh, push the button and expiration also they know when the child cries out fully yes that is the time but in the inspiration and expiration if at all you have a possibility of a foreign body you always have to have one more person who is supposed to give a thrust in the abdomen too but not commonly it is done so slightly what to say um maybe like uh, it may not be able to be accepted by all the parents too so whenever there is a doubt you can do a expiratory film previously we were doing fluoroscopy in ich will tell the pendular movement of the heart but nowadays we don't do fluoroscopy just these two but whenever there is a doubt you go in for a flexible scopy and most of the pediatricians they are able to make out by clinically by making out there is a decrease in the air entry in this hemithorax so clinically the most of the pediatricians are able to pick out and x-ray also gives them an added clue that this child has got a suspected foreign body the sound also helps them yeah great
Okay. Uh, on behalf of IAP TNSC, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, today's hero, Dr. Gauri Shankar, who was my senior in uh, MD, the immediate senior. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gauri Shankar, sir. And next, I thank uh, Dr. Nandini Kumaran, who has accepted as a moderator and is uh, helpful in smoothly conducting this event. And, and uh, our, uh, always I thank our uh, President uh, Dr. Aram Sendil, who has helped all the event and uh, to make a successful and uh, one of the best uh, event uh, for uh, IAPT NSC history. And I thank our uh, President elect uh, Dr. Ismail Sir to participate in this event. And uh, I thank our uh, audience and delegates and the PG students. I think a lot of PG students also today attended the event. And I thank one and all. And next um, program, September 5th, we are having chronic constipation. They are having, um, uh, it's uh, Saturday, next Saturday. And followed by, we are having uh, Pedi Week by South Pedi Khan. Uh, this uh, 6th to 12th, we are having Pedi, uh, uh, Pedi Khan, South Pedi Khan, we are having conducting. I thank one and all. Uh, sir, you want to add anything, Dr. Aram Sandil, sir? Yes, sir. We, we would like to thank Archana and the team for their uh, devoted uh, and staying us late, staying through the sessions. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you, madam. And uh, you have shown interest in academics and uh, you have taken us through the session. My personal thanks for you. And please continue your support. And thanks to Dr. Gauri Shankar, professor and my dear friend. Thank you so much. Uh, the September thank 5th, you. we are having programs, sir. That, uh... Yes. Dr. Mahalingam uh, and Dr. Vijay Anand, the pediatric surgeon from Madurai, will be uh, the panelist, and Dr. Balashankar will be moderating the session okay. on 5th September, Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Thank you, one and all.